All right, so welcome to our first uh, agroforestry program webinar of 2022. My name is Steve Gabriel. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Cornell Agroforestry Program Work Team, which brings together folks from across the Cornell community, both on campus and in uh, county offices, um, who have an interest or expertise in agroforestry. We also partner with a lot of um, service providers, uh, farmers, other folks out and about in the state who are on the program work team to help us think through um, emerging needs and priorities and, and things like that. Our home page can be found at cornellagroforestry.org, or you can also go um, through the Small Farms website at the link you see at the top of your screen. The Cornell Small Farms program is a, a statewide program that uh, works with a number of different uh, small farm and beginning farmer issues, agroforestry being just one of those. This website uh, is more of a portal to all the other wonderful resources that Cornell folks have assembled over the years. A um, couple of things I wanna highlight before we get going here with the topic for today. We do have a statewide survey still open for just a few more days till May 1st. Um, if you are a farmer, landowner, or, or taking care of land in any capacity in New York State and um, have interest in agroforestry, we'd love your feedback. This survey is going to be invaluable for us as we look for opportunities to fund and, and prioritize projects into the future. It doesn't take too long to complete, and uh, that'll be really helpful. So you can find the link on the, on the page, of course. As you scroll down on our homepage, you'll find a recent uh, presentation by our whole agroforestry team that's worth checking out. That was at the Fruit and Veg Expo in January. You can join our email list. You just get periodic updates um, and things like that. And then we have all of our webinars listed coming up for 2022. We have a nice lineup of different topics and speakers. Um, if you wanna see the archive of our webinars from last year, you'll find that on this webpage as well as if you go to YouTube and just search for Cornell Small Farms Program, you'll find um, webinars from last year and previous years, as well as a bunch of other videos there. So plenty of content to, to browse and check out. Finally, if you keep scrolling down the page, uh, you'll find some more uh, background information about agroforestry, and then you'll find some buttons here where we dive into specific topics where we have some materials, expertise, uh, et cetera, assembled. So again, this is more of a portal. So if you go into maple syrup, you're gonna be redirected to the Cornell Maple Program page, for instance, um, for more learning there. Uh, if you get into mushrooms, you'll be redirected to our mushroom project and so forth. So that's kind of the hub, the starting point for Cornell Agroforestry uh, work. And um, we appreciate the, the work team's uh, support of these webinars where we hope to highlight some of the exciting and, and new topics in agroforestry that we can shed some light on. So with that, I wanna welcome our presenters for today. Um, we have both uh, Aaron Kurtz and Michael Fournier from uh, NRCS. And the topic for today is about NRCS assistance for agroforestry in New York. And so we're gonna hear specifically about opportunities there. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Aaron, if you wanna share your screen. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen all right? Yes, thanks. All right. So uh, my name is Erin Kurtz. I am the district conservationist for NRCS. I currently cover Tompkins, Schuyler, and Cortland counties. I've been with NRCS for 16 years, but have spent most of my, um, most of my time actually out west, um, California, Oregon, uh, doing mainly a, a lot of different types of forestry uh, projects. So happy to be here. I am originally from upstate New York and this is um, back home for me and been here a couple of years um, learning about all the different kinds of new resources within our agency and the environments in New York. So this will just be a quick intro um, overview of NRCS some examples of the types of assistance that is available before getting into the details of the webinar topic. Um, NRCS is a federal agency under the US Department of Agriculture. We offer uh, technical and financial assistance focused on private lands. All of our services um, really focus on voluntary participation, we're non-regulatory, and um, 
we really support landowners taking ownership of their conservation plans. And of course, uh, we work with a variety of partners to deliver our services. Uh, we work with our customers over multiple land uses where they might have resource concerns. So pasture land, range land, crop land, um, orchards and vineyards, forest lands, and um, even their farmsteads. Uh, if they may have some concerns in their infrastructure or their energy on their farmsteads. Um, we have no acreage minimums um, for the folks that we work with. And we might work over um, you know, multiple land uses where, um, where people have resource concerns. So when we talk about resource concerns, we mean things like plant productivity, soil erosion, aggregate stability, nutrients and surface water, livestock production limitations like feed forage balance or inadequate water. Uh, maybe there's concerns with inadequate wildlife habitat or enhancements to habitat um, on the operation, um, and then uh, as well as energy concerns on farmsteads with you know, lighting or other infrastructure. We have a number of financial assistance programs, including the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP, um, and Conservation Stewardship Program that offer cost share to help treat um, those identified resource concerns. So I just thought I'd show some different practices and activities that might um, be typical to, um, to do in, uh, in our programs on different land uses. So here you can see we have our high tunnel program, um, some nice cover crops, here's a nice grass waterway. Here's more some of the infrastructure, maybe um, you know, different uh, a new RO system or preheaters on maple operations. Um, roofs and gutters, uh, energy efficiency upgrades, waste storage. We offer different practices to enhance grassland bird habitat or shrubland habitat, pollinator habitat. Uh, our practices and activities are usually um, scheduled um, in individually to help um, offset some of the, the costs associated with installation of those practices. So. Uh, we might offer uh, technical uh, assistance and specifications as well as a financial assistance. Uh, so you can see down here that we, you know, you might first uh, tackle your site prep and then establishment. Maybe you have uh, follow-up practices for uh, weed control. Um, so those are all examples of cost shareable items. Here you can see, um, it looks like up on the top right, you might see here, it looks like this is a, a fence that's uh, excluding a riparian area um, in the grazing system, which might also come along with pipeline and an offsite watering facility, for example, animal trails and walkways, prescribed grazing management, creating um, you know, a, a, a different rotation potentially, depending on you know, exactly what's going on on the operation. Here in forest lands, um, there's a girdled tree uh, for wildlife habitat. And then there's also you know, a number of different um, types of practices that would en enhance those um, operations, whether it's a production forest, a maple operation, or um, potentially just creating a, a more healthy, more vigorous uh, tree stand with uh, native species, maybe invasive species removal uh, to create better forest and habitats. So the steps to getting assistance, you know, we really just uh, recommend people give us a call. There's a, an NRCS office for pretty much every county nationwide. Um, so you would visit your field office, your service center, or just place a phone call. We really like to just come out and, and visit your property at your request, uh, walk around and really get an understanding of what the goals of your operation are. Um, if you're interested in our financial assistance programs, we have a rolling application cycle. Uh, so you can really submit an application at any time, but we have batching periods. So many times there will be a, a long lead up period. So it really depends on what you're interested in and what your timelines are uh, to potentially 
install some of those practices with with the um, programmatic help. So, you know, is a year too much? Is 18 months too much? It, it kind of depends because we have money available and at certain times of the year, kind of batch everybody's application and then move ahead with funding and creating the specifications for the types of practices that you're interested in completing. Um, it is a competitive program. So uh, we have a screening and a ranking process. And then if your um, application is funded, we work with you to uh, create the implementation specifications for each individual practice that's in your plan. This one looks like it kind of is a little off screen, but it essentially says the same thing. So visit your office, submit an application, work to develop a conservation plan for your property. And if its application is funded, we'll put together a cost estimate for that contract and uh, work with the contract holder to complete um, all the different practices within the time frame. We do offer um, increased payment rates um, and advanced payment up to 50% for historically underserved groups. Um, our practices are usually paid after the fact. So um, sometimes that initial cost can be a bit, um, a bit much, but it is a, a reimbursement process for most of our programs. Um, but we do have some, you know, different things we can offer to help offset that. So give me just a second here. I thought, hopefully you'll still be able to see my screen here. Um, this is our NRCS website. That's nrcs.usda.gov. You can go here and um, you'll see all different kinds of resources for you. You can link to our soil survey um, or go and look at our financial assistance programs and the different types of practices that are available and um, the variety of programs that are available. Here you can find our field office technical guide, which contains all of our different um, practice standards and specifications um, for the practices that we offer. And then if you would like to contact your local service center, you go to contact, there's a local service center directory. You click on your state, and then you can go to any county and see um, what's available for the Farm Services Agency and all the NRCS um, contacts there. And so that's what I've got. Thank you. We'll um, hand this over to Mike to get more into the details of the topic at hand. Thanks, Erin. Is everyone able to see my uh, screen yet? Nope, not yet. Let's see if we can get out of here. Oh, missed the share button. There you go. There we go. That should be an improvement. My show, uh, slide showing up? Yep. Okay, good. All right. Ready, said go. All right. Um, as Steve and Aaron pointed out, uh, I'm Mike Fournier. I'm NRCS's New York uh, State Staff Forester. Uh, I've been kicking around here for about 20 years in different capacities in New York. Uh, but I have a, a 
strong background in forestry, and I've been asked to, to give you sort of the insight on, on how NRCS perceives agroforestry as well as the, the specific practices that we do offer and, and support. So with that, I will start through. So Aaron touched on it a little bit, but our conservation planning efforts are, are sort of the foundation to all assistance that NRCS provides. Um, you know, before you get to go, you know, pass go and, and uh, participate in, in conservation pro programs themselves and, and receive the funding, you know, we, we typically will, you know, generate a, a conservation plan or, or even some of the, you know, supporting plans, uh, such as a nutrient management plan or a forest management plan or you know, a wildlife habitat plan to, to facilitate, you know, the, the conservation process. Um, you know, the, the conservation plan itself uh, em embraces a nine step decision making process. Um, as Aaron pointed out, you know, this is done on site, you know, with you in hand, um, uh, uh, evaluating, you know, and assessing, you know, both your personal goals and objectives, as well as, you know, the resources we have to work with to start with. Um, and, and then, you know, develop, you know, alternatives and, and uh, ideas that, that you can embrace before you decide, you know, where we're gonna go with, with the actual planning process. Um, you know, and that, that step seven decision-making um, item is, is, is critical because, you know, it, it's easy for us as professionals to make decisions and, and move forward, but then you have to live with it. So, you know, it's, it's very important for our staff to embrace, you know, the, the step seven in the, the planning process that it's, it's your decision before we move forward and, and actually you know, secure funds and, and so forth to, to implement. Uh, otherwise, without, you know, the decision being made by the landowner or the, the participant, uh, there, there's not much buy-in when, when we're telling you what to do. Um, resource concerns, Aaron um, touched on, um, but, but basically our, our planning process addresses those resource concerns. Uh, we're, we're going to deal with you know soil, water, air, plant, animal, and, and energy issues on your property. Assess it, give you the opportunity to, to decide where you want to go with it. Um, what we you know what we develop for alternatives as an agency are, are going to be you know uh, targeted towards the type of land management operation that you are. You know whether it's a, a private forest landowner, um, a grazer. Um, you know, cash crop or, or you know, row crop. We're, we're going to design the alternatives in a conservation plan to, to meet your um, operation. So, you know, the resource concerns that we, we have and we actually, you know, have posted on the uh, field office tech guide, you know, those have actual planning criteria that we, we design and, and address you know, to determine whether or not we're actually you know, uh, making a difference you know, on the landscape and, and solving those you know, resource uh, concerns. Yeah, the resource you know, concern uh, categories are, are typically you know, soil erosion, soil quality, water quality, water quantity, um, degraded air, degraded plant conditions, habitat, livestock, and energy. Um, as I pointed out, it, you know, this isn't just a, a plan that we develop in the office behind a computer and, and dump on your lap. You know, it's, it's interactive, you know, with the lander to, to solve your needs um, within reason. Um, you know, we're gonna, you know, as I pointed out, we're gonna come up with alternatives that you're gonna pick from in order to solve your problems, um, you know, and, and it comes with you know trade-offs as far as you know costs uh, and, and commitments, you know, in, in following up and, and maintaining any of the practices. Yeah, you know, the, the inventory part, you know, is critical um, that we we are designing and, and addressing, you know, what is there on site. Um, as, as many of you can relate to, 
you know, your problem isn't the same as your neighbors. Um, you know, and, and when we're dealing with a, a statewide, you know, clientele, um, you know, the, the landowners in the lower Hudson are, are going to be far different than, you know, Western New York or the Adirondacks, um, all of which are, are, you know, clients of ours that, that we try to address the resource concerns of. Um, just, just to go through some formalities, you know, NRCS has definitions of what forest land is uh, and the various land types. Uh, and that's important as to how we address, you know, planning criteria is, you know, what, what we're expecting to address from, an, uh, from a plant condition standpoint on forest land is gonna be different than a cropland. Um, yeah, so much of that is, is published and posted on our field office tech guide. Um, yeah, and I, I can bore you with, you know, the actual definitions, but the, the point is, is that each of the, the major land types, we have a definition of, and we have different protocols and, and procedures in order to address the resource concerns of. Um, but from an agroforestry standpoint, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with forest land, cropland, pasture, and, and some of those uh, in-between areas, which we classify as associated ag land. You know, the, the practices themselves are, as Aaron pointed out, um, posted to our uh, field office tech guide in section four. And um, yeah, for, for references, yeah, the website that, that uh, Aaron gave you a look at will allow you to navigate easily to the field office tech guide. Section four, as I mentioned, has all of the actual practice standards and any of the supporting documents, you know, such as overview sheets, um, you know, statements of work, job, you know, the actual job sheet or IRs, um, and any other supporting documents are all posted there under that practice. Um, and you're, you know, as a general public, you're all free and, you know, and, and have access to that. And I encourage you to, you know, to become familiar with some of them as you start working with us, of course. Um, agroforestry, it's, it's the blending of, of two worlds. Um, you know, it incorporates, you know, tree production and other ag crops. Um, Yeah, the, the, the practices that we support under agroforestry with NRCS are alley cropping, multi-story cropping, riparian forest buffer, civil pasture, and windbreaks and shelter belts. Um, and I'll get into each of those you know, five practices uh, and, and give you some you know, detail behind of how we actually provide this assistance. Um, so alley cropping. Um, it's basically, you know, uh, you as, as the operator deciding what crops, you know, you are looking to produce, you know, in conjunction with, with orientated trees that are, you know, that can be planted for anything from, you know, timber, fiber, fruit production, nut production, um, integrated on the same uh, planting unit. Yeah, you know, so you know, in the picture here cited, you can see you know some of the uh, nut producing trees, you know, in in rows adjacent to uh, hay. It could be you know vegetable crops. It could be you know field crops. But you know the idea is that there's a benefit, you know, either from you know protection from wind or excessive uh, radiation, you know, solar radiation, you know, to, to you know that would actually allow for better production of, of of either crop. Um, the, the only downfall, you know, from, from a, an actual practice perspective, you know, New York does not support the alley cropping practice in its uh, tech guide. And, and the reason behind that is um, with the varied landscape of New York, you know, a practice does a landowner, you know, little benefit you know, and, and how to actually accommodate the needs on site. We have, you know, supporting practices to that agricultural production system 
called alley cropping, you know, that would actually be conducive to, you know, meeting the, the, the resource concerns and, and needs for planning an alley cropping system. Um, tree and shrub establishment, uh, whether it's cover crops or, or conservation cover. Uh, if it's looking, you know, if you're looking for hay crops, you know, we have practices that address, you know, proper establishment of, of hay and pasture crops. Um, you know, if, if erosion, you know, in the alleys themselves are of issue, we have other you know, erosion uh, practices that are associated with, with cropland. Um, we, we can integrate wildlife into these various agro, you know, agroforestry systems as well. Um, you know, the, the 420 wildlife habitat planting allows um, pollinators, you know, and pollinator habitat to be developed as well as any other targeted wildlife. Multi-story cropping, which will soon, you know, within this uh, calendar year, be renamed to farmers, you know, forced farming. Uh, and, and that incorporates, you know, the, the gamut of, you know, herbaceous you know, uh, plants, whether it be ginseng, medicinals, uh, you know, various craft type crops that can be grown in the understory. You know, uh, there's, there's, I wouldn't say the sky's the limit, but basically, you know, allow yourself to be you know, creative of how to develop a for, forced farming system. Uh, we, we do have that practice on our tech guide. Um, it's not utilized probably, oh, I, I would say definitely not enough, but it would incorporate you know, or cover um, various conservation activities associated with uh, maple sugaring, you know, as, as I mentioned, uh, the, the herbaceous you know, medicinal and, and uh, craft type crops, um, mushroom production. It, it would all fall under the, the force farming yeah, and, and meaning that you know there's non-timber crops that are basically being cultivated and you know and harvested under a forest cover. You know, so that would require you know management of the overstory uh, as well as you know whatever production activities are necessary to, to, to maximize you know the, the yield from your, your targeted uh, forest crop. Riparian forest buffers are, are classified by NRCS at the national level as a you know, as a agroforestry practice, just due to the fact of the interface between you know a riparian corridor uh, along a stream or wetland or lake um, and the actual upland ag portions. Um, they they serve as you know, water quality buffers as well as providing habitat and um, you know can be you know modified, enhanced to include, you know, some fruit and nut producing crops as well in the future. Uh, and, and then, you know, ultimately as they mature, um, forest crops, you know, such as, you know, or timber crops, I should say, can be removed from there as, as long as the integrity and then the function of their apron buffer is not compromised. Yeah, and, and many of the, the buffers here in New York that are, you know, you'll see along many of the, the waterways, you know, that have been in, in installed under the Conservation Reserve Program. Um, those range from 35 to 100 foot in width uh, and, and require trees and shrubs or, or, you know, one or the other to be established um, at a, a predetermined uh, stocking rate in order to meet the you know, the, the objectives of the, of the planting. Silver pasture. Um, I, I can't really do service to this, you know, to this particular practice. Um, you know, from a, from a technical standpoint, I, I believe uh, Brett Chedzoy with Extension, you know, is, is New York's expert um, and has been working both you know, on his own farm, as well as with, with many cooperators in trying to promote civil pastures. Um, civil pastures are not just turning livestock into the woods and, and hoping for the best. It, it's a, a concerted planned effort. 
um, to, to basically, you know, provide, you know, forage for lives, you know, for, for planned livestock as part of a grazing system under a forest canopy. And, and you know, the, the, the forest products can be managed for anything from, you know, short term, you know, tree products to long term uh, timber production. Um, and it's it basically, yeah, from, from NRCS's perspective, it requires both a grazing plan and a forest management plan. Um, similar to alley cropping, NRCS does not support the civil pasture practice. And, and that's due to the fact that, you know, um, for the most part, we can develop uh, a, a civil pasture system, you know, uh, of providing quality forage, similar to what you see in the photo here now, you know, quality forage under a forest canopy that's either in an existing forest or in a, a pasture that has been planted to trees and, and allowed the trees to provide the, the added benefit of, of shade and, and buffering of, of grass and forage production during the, you know, the, the harsh midsummer months when, you know, everything else is crashing from a production standpoint. And under a civil pasture, you can still maintain you know, a, a reasonable amount of forage production. You know, and in order to accomplish it, you know, NRCS is, is you know, fully supporting of either using forest stand improvement to reduce stocking, to allow for the forages to establish underneath. Um, you know, the, the 512 pasture and hay planting is, is gonna be part of that plan to, as, as well as uh, prescribed grazing in order to Again, you know, establish the forage, you know, with the, the forest protection over top. Um, yeah, you know, if we're taking a, a piece of pasture land and, and converting it into a, a civil pasture, you know, we, we have access to the, the, the tree and shrub establishment practice that we would, you know, basically plan and, and pursue and implement, you know, to, to gain, you know, the, the benefits of the trees overhead. You know, and, and with, the system approach, you know, we're, we're looking in the, you know, not just the, you know, looking at the trees and then the forage, we're also looking at making sure that, you know, there's adequate water within that grazing system, you know, to, to allow, you know, efficient grazing to occur. Yeah, and, and some of the, you know, the benefits, you know, to folks that are considering, you know, civil pasture or looking at, you know, um, drops in, in forage production in mid mid to late summer you know we're looking at you know improved plant vigor um, the, there is a trade-off of that the, the total production may be down from an open you know grown pasture but you know we maintain that improved vigor during you know those those key summer months um, you know the civil pasture and the overstory over reduces animal stress during those heat periods of july and august uh, you know, and then there's also the added benefit of, of you know, either maintaining or, or providing additional habitat for wildlife. Um, you know, and in the income portion of it, you know, that comes down to the management. You know, if, if uh, a, a grazer is, is adequately using their silver pasture and maintaining the forage, you know, they're getting a, a, a co-benefit. They're getting, you know, you know a, a slow but sure long-term production of, of a timber product at the same time, taking you know short-term yields of, of forage off of that same acreage, it, it helps with uh, paying taxes. But but you know again, yeah, it's it's part of a bigger system. Um, you know, in this particular photo, you can see at the, the top of the you know one through you know paddocks one through eleven are, are you know forested areas that are in conjunction with. You know, the the open traditional pastures they're all rotated through at different rates based on, on recovery based you know based on most of the other premises of, of you know good uh, pasture land or grazing management yeah and uh, yeah it's catching on yeah you know, there, there's more and more folks considering you know, and developing civil pastures within their properties in New York, um, but it's it's not a, a it's not for everyone, and it's not 
something that's going to be you know promoted you know you know statewide per se you know with with the same results um there are some some good success stories um there are others that are you know still learning as they go um but as i, I pointed out i think initially it's not just turning animals loose into the woods it's it's managing them as part of a, a grander grazing system you know and, and with that you know new resource concerns aren't going to be created that are you know not easily corrected by you know either you know duration of, of grazing or you know by uh you know augmenting with some underseedings or overseedings you know in those areas to, to promote better you know forage quality and probably you know the, the least popular or, or used uh, Agroforestry practice within, you know, NRCS's uh, field office tech guide, you know, listing is is windbreaks or shelter belts. Um, wind erosion historically has not been a, a major issue in New York, so with that, there's not as much, you know, demand for you know, regularly occurring windbreaks. You know, to date, we we've installed a few in, in some of the uh, the key. You know, vegetable production areas, uh, but but outside of that, you know, minus you know, non-planned hedgerows, we we haven't you know been involved in much in the way of windbreak or shelter belt establishment. Uh, where you may see some of the you know, demonstrations uh, are, are the use of uh, living snow fences. Um, there's a couple scattered statewide, you know, that have been installed using uh, willow. Uh, Pretty successful, but again, you know, they, they have a lifespan, you know, of somewhere between 10 and 15 years using willow and, and it requires some, some maintenance in order to maintain the, the, the efficiency and, and you know, effectiveness of, of harvesting snow from, from key areas along roads or, you know, around farmsteads. Yeah. And as I mentioned, you know, we do maintain and support uh, the, the 380, you know, uh, windbreak shelter belt standard in our tech guide. Um, but along with that, there, you know, as part of the, the maintenance and, and reestablishment, you know, there's going to be opportunities for pruning and for, you know, site prep, you know, to establish new or replace old, um, you know, it will be part of you know, a, a grander cropping system in most cases. Uh, I wanted to take time out before I, you know, turn the slides off here. Um, NRCS, you know, is, is a partner with the National Agroforestry Center. Um, the Forest Service basically pays the bills for the building. NRCS, you know, provides uh, staff, you know, some of the staff as well as, um, you know, some of the, you know, the, the technical support for the National Agroforestry Center. It's based in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, but basically there's, there's folks scattered across the country that are associated with that core staffing um, that, that can provide some, some benefit. You know, there's a, an agroforester up at a UVM in Burlington, Vermont, and in, uh, you know, some of you may have crossed paths with, with her and, and, and she has been, you know, helpful, you know, in, in supporting um, outreach and education, you know, both to extension as well as utilizing, you know, NRCS programs to, to, to do so. And with that, I will close my presentation. And we can turn it back over to Steve to uh, entertain the questions that are coming up. Great, thanks so much to both of you for sharing the background. Um, encourage folks to, uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you want and ask a question or to use the chat box to enter any questions you might have so we can have some discussion around anything that was shared today or any of the kind of particular um, situations you might be thinking about uh, wanting to work with NRCS. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a question uh, from Chris about any resource recommendations for techniques, practices dealing with wildlife, eating forest farm crops like deer. I guess I'll take that one. Um, when it comes to actual farm crops, uh, there, there's a lot of hesitancy for NRCS to be involved because uh, the, the resource concern isn't necessarily documented. You know, it's, it's a crop production issue in mo many cases. And, and through most of our programs, NRCS is, is mandated to address resource concerns. So if, if, you know, basically there's actual crop damage, you know, from a production perspective, um, the NRCS conservation funds are limited. Um, it's not to you know, say that, you know, through working, you know, in conjunction with extension that we can't help, you know, from a planning perspective, but from a funding standpoint, um, EQIP in particular, you know, is not typically available to address, you know, those types of, of crop losses. Um, you know, if there's other resource concerns that are directly related to it, um, you know, that are non-crop land, um, the conservation practices are available to at least address, if not fund any of the protective items. You know, so if we're doing a, a landscape restoration you know, of any sort, you know, of non-crop land, uh, we can build in whether it's temporary fencing or, you know, other means of controlling deer from coming in and, and trashing, you know, the, that restoration effort. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, a, a cornfield or bean field that's, that's being, you know, completely obliterated by, you know, over browsing or, or foraging by deer, that is not something that, that Congress has authorized us to, to fix. So I guess um, extending that, there's some other questions around uh, sort of preventing damage to, I guess, like forest regeneration from deer, or is it um, just in yep. the establishment of a practice that you could you could apply potentially for fencing or, or protection? If it was incorporated in a, a forest management plan, um, to, to protect, you know, the, the natural regeneration, um, protective measures can be built into that treatment because again, you know, the, the resource concern would be either, you know, the, the lack of regeneration, you know, or uh, a structure and composition issue or health and vigor issue of that particular forest stand. Um, if, if that's basically being created by excessive browsing, we can block the deer from getting in there in one way or another, whether it's, you know, through um, strategic felling practices, uh, if it's slash walls or fencing, you know, there's, there's opportunities for us to plan that. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, the funding that's available for it may not be adequate for all the expenses, you know, for, you know, a, a 10 foot tall, you know, woven wire fence to be installed. So that, that would be a decision from the landowner's perspective, you know, is, is the funding that's available to, to erect that fence adequate, you know, for, for, you know, what the funding, you know, level is. I hope that helps to answer some of that. Yeah, and then uh, Ron's asking, in addition to that, I think, is the use of slash walls uh, to keep deer out instead of fencing. Uh, Yes, it is an option. We're waiting for, uh, actually, in Schuyler County, we have a landowner who's ready and willing. Uh, we just have to hope that the stars align, that the, you know, the ranking and the funding all comes into place in, in time to, to make it happen. So by all means, if we have foresters out there in the landscape that, that feel that that would be a feasible option for their clients, um, if they were to spec it out and plan it, um, it would make it, you know, a lot easier um, to, to consider for funding. And if, if any of the foresters run in particular, you know, 
if you have clients, um, by all means, you know, pull an extension, myself, whoever, you know, to, to try to make that happen, you know, and, and utilize the, the correct practices, you know, to, to allow for that. Great. And yeah, I think the take home is to consider the resource concerns that things might address versus like crop cropping concerns, which. Yeah, that, that, that's the biggest divide. I mean, if we were allowed to, we would be doing it probably more often. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, we're mandated by the, the statute of the farm bill that we cannot. Um, all right, we have, uh, where'd I go here? Um, uh, do you need a CNMP um, to be eligible for practices like 512 and 612? So um, let's see, I think what five, 512 is forage and biomass planting and 612 is tree and shrub establishment. Um, you know, a CNMP, a comprehensive nutrient management plan would be recommended um, for anybody that needed one. Um, so that would be a decision that we'd make um, mutually you know, with a landowner, but in short, no, we don't require you to have a CNMP to be eligible for those practices. The only time we um, would really need to see that CNMP is with infrastructure type practices surrounding uh, livestock. So when there's covered barns or, um, you know, waste management, um, there's a need for nutrient management, perhaps if you're um, um, spreading, spreading manure, spreading waste products. So um, then we, you know, that would be a helpful document um, because that helps look at, you know, soil testing for um, where nutrients are being applied to fields, um, content of waste products, um, all those sorts of things is when that would be recommended. But no, it's not a requirement for those types of practices. Okay. Um, Samantha, I see your hands up. Do you have a question you want to voice? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you um, to Aaron and to Mike for your presentation. There's a lot of interest in agroforestry, and I think, Mike, you said it really great, how agroforestry is a combination of farming and forestry, and it has some special um, properties, which I think is why this webinar is, is so useful. And I'm going to kind of go back. I'm sorry to belabor a point that was brought up early, but I just have further questions about the NRCS assistance that's available for some agroforestry practices. Um, in particular, you said practices like alley cropping and silvopasture, pasture, while not officially as standalone practice not accepted in New York, there are supporting practices such as tree planting or pruning or fencing. Um, and so I guess my question is to get a little bit of clarity on, let's say if we want to install a civil pasture where we're adding um, trees to an existing pasture or for building an alley cropping system, can we look to NRCS to help um, offset costs associated with tree protection in this case? Um, or yes, as part of that okay. tree establishment, we would expect those to be protected. Okay. Yeah, and, and the, the various cost levels that we have you know, for payment, you know, take that into consideration. You know, so there would be options for the planner to include, you know, the, the necessary protection, you know, for establishing it. You know, you know whether it be individual tree tubes or, or fencing, you know, that would be incorporated in that plan. Okay. Um, so, so where, where I struggle or where the, the grazing specialist or myself has struggled with, with civil pasture have been the fact that the resource concerns that we're addressing we we can't do it feasibly with one practice right. and, and one practice um you know set of uh payment scenarios you know we're with equip in particular we're, we're restricted to you know typically no more than a half dozen different payment levels per practice to, to actually incorporate into a contract so you know thinking that you know statewide in, in many of the you know the opportunities that we have in developing civil pastures in New York, what, you know, one of those six scenarios may not actually cover the cost adequately. So, you know, we've over the, the course of the last, oh, I, I'm going to say, close to six years, you know, rather than adopting the civil pasture 
practice, we've embraced the, the civil pasture system and, and realizing that, you know, a conservation planner should be able to select the, the adequate number of practices to fit that you know, site specific need, you know, whether it's planting into a pasture or thinning a, a stand to a level, you know, to, to promote good forage underneath. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's I think it's a wise approach. And I guess my, my question is really originating because someone had asked earlier if fencing could be used to protect crops or if that was sort of the way in which you were responding. And then in the silvo pasture, the alley cropping scenario, our crops are the trees, the trees produce the crops. And so I guess I was wondering in the alley cropping silvo pasture system, it seems like fencing can be used to protect the trees, whereas that would not be appropriate in more of a annual row cropping system. Right, and it's, it's due to the fact that the conservation practice that's being con, you know, contracted or installed needs that protection in order to, to get to a point where it's able to function. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a permanent perimeter fence to protect the crop. It's, it's a, 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 maybe a, a six to 10 year window of protection that's necessary to establish you know, that, that tree crop. Right. Yeah, because once once the trees typically over you know six to eight feet tall, uh, we no no longer have the threat of deer other than you know some some buck rubbing on occasion. Great, thank you. And another question from Catherine about other options for projects that involve multiple landowners who'd like to coordinate within an ag district. Oh, I, I guess I, I would need some more specifics on that. Um, you know, are, are you thinking like projects that span multiple land ownerships or, uh, you know, what kind of coordination? Because generally um, options for programs for funding, you know, there's got to be an applicant for that funding who would receive funding. So if it spans, you know, multiple types of ownership, then either multiple people would sign up um, individually, or there are options to, um, you know, to that contract holder. They have control, effective control, of the properties through, say, a lease um, or something of that nature. Like there is some flexibility, but it can it can be tricky. There's um, it, it just depends on the scenario. So, um, can you hear me? I'm. This is Catherine speaking. Yep. I live in an area that used to be um, a large historical family farm. It's been broken up into smaller parcels, but there is a lot of interest in the neighborhood. Um, it's not a, a highly developed neighborhood. It's, a, um, it's still a farm neighborhood. There is a lot of interest in uh, coordinating because we have very large herds of deer. We, we probably, over 300 acres, we probably have 300 deer. You know, it's, it's very intensive with the deer damage and the invasives. So we were wondering, you know, if we could put together some kind of coordinated program um, where we could help reforest some of the land, but not have it, um, you know, gnawed down to nothing by the deer. Yeah, we would, you'd want to discuss that with your, you know, your local area, but generally, um, you know, because we work with landowners on their land. So if there's private parcels and um, each, each landowner would need to, you know, effectively buy into what they were going to um, apply for, it would, it would most likely be separate unless there was, um, you know, an overall lease to um, a, a manager or something of that nature. Okay, so there is no type of community grant program for coordinating or anything like that? Um, not that I know of through our agency, although I couldn't speak for you know, other opportunities out there. What about on a town or municipal basis? So again, it depends who the landowner is and who has effective control over that land. Um, and we, do, we don't contract with um, other units of government. Okay, thank you, that's clear. And that's from the programming standpoint, from a planning 
perspective, though, it, it, it could be a pooled process to plan, you know, and, and, you know, the local field office could, could help with piecing it together from an area-wide perspective. So, oh. you know, it, not to say that we, you know, we couldn't provide technical assistance, but the financial assistance is where there would be limits based on individual contracts. I see. Well, but there is, there is the possibility then to work with someone locally on the planning. That would be helpful. Yes. So, so from the planning perspective, there's also the, the local uh, soil and water conservation district that may also you know, be helpful in that process of, of pulling it together as a community. Great, great. Because we were thinking of doing it kind of as a watershed um, because there's a, a lake, a number of ponds, you know, everything is connected in, in our little natural world. Um, and just, you know, having a plan and then individual landowners being able to enter into contracts if they wanted to or not, that would be helpful. That's great. Thank you. All right. Um, there's a comment from Chris about uh, with increasing wildfire, wildfire threats. Seems like an initial slash wall combined with something about transforming something to transform it into a living wall uh, could serve as a longer term barrier against deer. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, and unless anyone has any more questions, um, I think we are complete. Um, last call for anyone want to bring anything up. I think there was a um, see there was a request uh, to show a slide again with a list of practices and numbers, but um, maybe Mike, if you're willing to uh, share some of those slides with the agroforestry practices and those numbers, I could post those along with the recording if that made sense. Okay. Just yeah, so I can I can that. provide you the PowerPoint. Yeah, then then uh, then focus that when I post the recording to the agroforestry page, you can you can reference those numbers. Uh, and that was um, like just a, a sampling of some of our practices. We actually have hundreds of practices. <laughs> so um, if you did want to go to the field office technical guide link um, in section four, it'll be, um, I believe, um, alphabetized. Um, and when you go in, you'll see all the different numbers for all the various practices that we offer through our programs. Um, obviously, those are really all of them. Um, I think Mike had the sampling of um, of. Uh, practices that would be more um, typical for someone interested um, in agroforestry, but those are all listed um, in that field office technical guide. Yep, that my my listing was not all inclusive. Great. Well, thanks. I'll definitely post the link to that as well. Um, well, thanks so much to Aaron and Mike, and um, as well as to James Schleppenbach, who's on the call, who helped organize this session. Um, again, we'll uh, post the recording and um, some follow-up info, and um, you can find that at cornellagroforestry.org. But everyone have a great afternoon. Take care. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you.